Hello, you're very welcome to All In, the new business show here on Joe, backed by AIB. This week, we're going to be talking about the pivot, that critical moment in the lifetime of your career or your company where maybe you hit a wall, maybe you see a new opportunity that didn't exist before, but either way, the results are the same. You're going to totally change direction and the strategy of your company. So here to help us talk about that, we have the woman whose company went through several successful pivots before being recently acquired. She's now director at the World Trade Center in Dublin. It's Rani Debray and the man who spotted the major opportunity in digital media right back in 2007, Niall McGarry of Maximum Media. And in the all-in trailblazer hot seat, we have a man who swapped finance for fitness. Now his health supplements are on the shelves of some of the biggest stores in Ireland and the UK. But before we get to all that time for some housekeeping, if you haven't already, why not hit subscribe to get the full show on podcast or on YouTube. We are also, of course, on Twitter with the username at allin underscore business. We're on LinkedIn and Facebook too, and you can contact us anytime, any platform using the hashtag allinbusiness. Joe presents All In, together with AIB, backing Irish business. So let's get started. Uh, Niall and Rani, the topic of pivoting, always an interesting one. Let's start with the moment in your career that you figured out it was time to pivot. Yeah, so I um, had started my business um, as a virtual assistance agency just at the peak of the recession. And, um, and the reason I actually started it was because I was invited to leave my job at the time. I and like uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> Got curly I'd, finger, I think it's called. <laughs> there you go. Um, and uh, I pitched the idea of virtual assistance to my then employer, who just didn't get it. Mm. So I figured that other people would, um, but I figured wrongly because it took a long time and it was tumbleweed. No one was getting it. And I was really committed to the idea of it, but I was, I needed to pay the bills. And I think I made something like, oh, it was tiny, like four grand in the first year, which was obviously not sustainable. So I thought, well, no one's getting virtual assistance. I have to try and do something that people will understand that I don't have to keep explaining and educating the marketplace about it. So I picked call answering because call answering was something at the time that people did understand. It's fairly black and white Mm. and uh, I didn't need to sell it so hard. So I began doing that with a view to bringing it back into the virtual assistance. And we did that by changing how we took the messages. So um, immediately, you know, I rigged up a a home office initially with um, the telecom systems to be able to answer calls, had a small team who were answering the calls, got some fairly easy clients. But what we did was when we took the messages, instead of saying, can I pass on that message, I trained my team to say, is there any way I can help you? Because then when a person is asked that, they will naturally start to go into what it is they want. So for example, at the time, say Janice would ring and she was like, well, maybe you can help me. I'm looking for a, a copy of invoice one, two, three, four. Um, And then what my team would do is relay the message to our client Mm -hmm. saying, you know, Janice rang, she's looking for a copy of invoice one, two, three, four. By the way, did you know that we do that as part of our virtual assistance service? Would you like to try it free of charge for three weeks? And it was a fairly seamless way of doing it. And then we got one client, two clients, three clients and upsold fairly easily. So I pivoted back into what it was that I originally thought. And then five years later, the business was fairly successful. Oh, Niall, I'm going to come to you in one second, but I just want to keep you here for one second, Rani, because I know you have an interesting um, story, a little backstory there in terms of what started to happen when you asked people, is there any way I can help you? Mm-hmm. You were telling me earlier about trying to get someone's dog into the Maldives and <laughs> or flying someone's designer dress first class across the Atlantic. Yeah, so when we got into the virtual assistance, we, uh, by, quite by accident, we started to acquire some clients who were in the high net worth and ultra high net worth space. And then the nature of the problems that we were solving became completely different. So instead of looking after SME owners who were, uh, you, can you check my email? Can you be my virtual PA? Can you answer my phone? Can you book me a taxi? All of this kind of thing. The nature of the problems began to be, can you find me this dress and fly it across from one side of the world to the other? My poodle needs an outfit. Can you find one? Um, Can you make sure my poodle can be quarantined and flown around the world? Can you make sure that my shipment of gold travels across Europe safely? Can you send me to Ibiza with a pre-populated, with 20 women, a boat on a yacht on the Ibiza in Ibiza town? So all of these kind of crazy problems. And at that stage, that marked the start of another pivot because at that stage, we sort of realized that the virtual assistance game, everyone was in the place now, everyone was in the marketplace and it became unsustainable. So we went into the ultra high net worth space and rebranded as a concierge service. Accidental pivot. Yeah. And what about you, Niall? Where, when would you say your pivot moment was? Was it 07 when you kind of saw that opportunity in digital media? 
Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't really, I think the word pivot, because obviously nowadays all these words kind of, again, that come out of Silicon Valley, they've almost become bywords for a bit, of a, a bit of a joke and a bit of a kind of like, that's how you're going to save your business. Whereas I think pivot essentially is just innovation. You're constantly innovating. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that we are in a scenario whereby businesses constantly tweak and change and sometimes radically alter their business objective and their business plan. And I think the smart entrepreneur does that based on where they see markets going or new opportunities or where they see certain parts of their business model becoming defunct. So if you look at, again, from a media perspective, every media business that's been around for 100 plus years have to pivot or have to, sa to save their business. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to change. And even within that, we, in my first business at Impact Media, we definitely added things, strings to our bow on a continual basis. And did the, the business at the end look very different to the business at the beginning? Absolutely. And that's why it's very, very difficult to write a business plan. And we know our good friends at AIB love business plans when you're going out looking for funding. But at the same time, it is very difficult to, run a business plan, to write a business plan over five years. So I don't so much obsess about pivot, but what I'm obsessed with is innovation and the fact that you constantly need to tweak and change your business model to stay ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And we were living through absolutely out and out disrupted time. And that's why kind of this word pivot has become so famous in that um, if you throw a certain amount of uh, shit at a wall and it doesn't stick, you've got to, you've got to go a different direction. And that's mm -hmm. just life and that's just business. But the people who don't are the people who kind of think pivoting is bad are the ones who absolutely say saddle stitch the business plan and potentially uh, f fall, at, fall because of that. So I absolutely love the idea of innovation. The, cha the challenge can al always be, and I've kind of touched on this before, is that bringing people along the journey. What you've got to do as a leader is come across as someone who accepts and embraces change readily, but not necessarily schizophrenic or not someone who just constantly doesn't seem to know what they're doing. And that, that is a big challenge. Yeah. And that was going to be my next question, actually, for both of you. I'm interested in timelines here, and especially maybe if you're writing business plans for someone like AIB or got something to prove and you, you want to lay out your map for the next while. How do you know when to pivot, when you're pivoting too soon? And what's the difference between, how can you know the difference between pivoting and I just didn't give this a chance and I, I jumped the gun and, you know, maybe even freaked myself out, saw problems that weren't there. Yeah, well, How can you know your own mind there? It, well, it comes down mm. again, I've talked about this before, it comes down to the gut instinct of the entrepreneur. So the key to any people, or to people who succeed in business is understanding their gut and what their gut tells them on an ongoing basis. And again, it has been cliched. So there's lots of business vernacular that's overly cliched and then undervalued. And I think that's one of the things because ultimately intuition is what decides and dictates all your business success going forward. You... Uh, Believe, almost like a mystic meg, kind of crystallise, crystallising kind of in your mind where you think things are going to go. And that is going to happen on a continual basis. You've got to be able to kind of decide that, let's say you went down a different, a certain road, you brought the team down and that's not the right road. You've actually got more clarity. Mm -hmm. I always liken kind of like a business can be like walking in a forest in the fog and the further on you walk, the more you can see, but you can't see an awful lot at the beginning. So sometimes you can go up the wrong path and you bring your team down with you and they're going, Jeez, here we are again, and you've, you know this isn't where we thought it'd be. It's, it's all like, on you. <laughs> yeah, and it's all on you. And again, you it, it, that that management of change is very, very difficult. But ultimately, if you end up at the at the the successful entrepreneurs obviously end up at the right part. And, and even though I don't know if there is an end, but if they, they keep getting closer to what seems to be successful mm. or their business is doing well, then it, the ends justify the means. But the there's no exact point. I don't believe. I think that you could have a very specific vision for your business for the next two to three years. And definitely from our perspective, you cannot plan much further than that. You cannot plan. Like, I like to think decade to decade. I think successful business people do think decade to decade. But in terms of your day-to-day -day business, you can't look beyond two to three years because we're living through extraordinary technological change and that's going to even be stepped up in the 2020s. We're sitting here without realising the change that's going to happen in the next decade. For me, that's exciting. For, 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 for people who don't accept pivoting or innovation or people who are obsessed with sticking on a solid, on one specific path, They'll, they'll potentially find themselves challenged. So the pivot or the change or the innovation is going to continue to happen. It's not a specific point in the journey. Okay. And, and for you, Rani, I know you've, um, you've been something of a chameleon. You've been worked as a journalist, a press officer, project manager in a construction company. That's before you became a serial entrepreneur and now you're with the World Trade Center in Dublin. Mm -hmm. You must know a lot about when that moment is, what Niall touched on there, listening to your gut instincts. What's the magic formula for you? 
Well, it's, I would really, really agree with what you've said about um, the gut instinct. And a lot of people are afraid to listen to that because what they'll listen to instead is their accountant saying, look at the balance sheet. This is working, this is working, this is working and stick with it. Unfortunately, I 100% agree with you. If you keep sticking with something that... You don't need to be... This doesn't be unfortunate, though. Don't worry about it. Uh, sometimes people do, but... But I mean, sorry, you mean... Un <laughs> I agree with you, fortunately, but unfortunately... I'm joking. yeah. <laughs> um, you have to... So for me... I always left at the peak of the party. Right. I always left when things were going really well mm. because I had that feeling. I knew, for example, with the virtual assistants, everyone started showing up. Everyone started popping up and people were trying yeah. to steal the name and everything. And I'd happened to have trademarked the intelligent help. I'd got MissMoneyPenny.ie mm. and I'd been responsible for educating the marketplace. And all of a sudden, you know, even former contractors were becoming competitors and I realized it was unsustainable long term. So I left at the peak of the party and it, partly it was gut instinct, but the gut instinct led to a really fairly deep knowledge knowing that I'd lost my heart for it. And when you lose your heart for it, you can't serve your customers well. You can't, you can't innovate because you're not seeing the things that you need to see. You don't stay up and you don't have the passion to mm -hmm. stay up and read the things you need to read and absorb everything that you need to absorb and listen to your customers. And so I think the gut instinct does... Obviously, you know, you have to look at, as you say, throwing off at the wall and see what sticks. If something isn't working, you have to be humble enough to see that. But they always say people give up when they're about 95% of the way there. So I, I did do that, but I, I've definitely always followed my gut. And ultimately, you have to be happy in what you're doing, because if you're unhappy as a leader and if you don't believe in it, mm. your team feel that. And then you start to shed people. Yeah, it's funny you say that, like educating the marketplace is definitely one of the most frustrating places an entrepreneur can be right where you go into a space you do it better than anybody else and then everyone comes along and do no listen that's business that is absolutely people are entitled to do that but from my own perspective i feel that that's something that can be very 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 frustrating because you constantly show how to change what you're doing change it up and then people come along and just try and copy that model and they do it to you know whatever different degree but it can be frustrating and it can definitely because ultimately you know business people or entrepreneurs are you know are humans at the end of the day and they feel they we, sometimes people don't realize what we feelings do mm -hmm. and it can be very very challenging where you've gone into a space you've done it better than anybody and then other people come along and start eating into your market share because of the necessity to have competition and like there has to be competitiveness in every marketplace right because that gives consumers choice we all ex ag agree and accept with that but that can lead as Randy mentioned maybe potentially starting to fall out of love with the business because you've gone into the space, you've done it well, other people are doing it. And then if you can't find the gears to change or there is no gears to change, the market is kind of static, it can then lead to a scenario where you fall out of love with a business. I know my first business with Impact Media, at the end of it, I absolutely was had fallen out of love with it. And then again, yeah. that's a dangerous place for the leader of the business to be because how can you motivate and inspire people? It, it, where we are now in the in the actual proper media business, I love the industry, love the space. I didn't actually realise that that's what I was born to do. Mm -hmm. it took me 30 years to realise that setting up this business was what I was made to do and born to do. I didn't have a journalism degree, although... My sister happens to be a brilliant journalist, so it was definitely in the family and in the DNA, maybe. But the, the you have to have love for the model you're in, and then within that, you will be faced with challenges on a consistent basis that can take that away. But once that love drops, then you're definitely right to get out of the space. That that passion and that might make the decision a bit easier in a sense. If you've mm. fallen out of love with something, it's not that hard. Or it's it's a little bit easier to step away from it. But do either of you ever feel that? Uh, Maybe you did it too soon or have you ever pivoted in a way that you actually then regretted or thought um, that you made the wrong call? Uh, not really. I, th I think you can never join the dots going forward. And I think, I think that when in, with anything in life, when you get what you want, it usually never happens the way that you wanted it to happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have any regrets about that. I feel like I got out of the right things at the right time. I sold off everything last year from the money penny under the money penny umbrella. And it was absolutely the right thing to do. And I also think there's a lot of, um, you have to have the humility to realize as well that if you've made a mistake, learn from it. Um, I don't have any regrets because any mistakes I feel that I have made, I've mm -hmm. probably taken something from it and they stand to me. Um, I don't think anything ever really was yeah. too soon. Yeah, I, I think it's important to it. maybe create the distinction between, let's we'll say, exiting, mm. which is what Annie's done successfully, and, and, and pivoting in the sense that, like, one is, as I said, that innovation piece of the business, one is then making decisions to mm. step off. And I think that definitely does uh, happen, and it can happen for the right reasons in that someone's taken the business as far as they can take it, they've created employment, they've created success, and they get 
a payday at the end of it and then hopefully that entrepreneur goes on and does a successful number of other projects and creates more um, opportunities for themselves and for other people and that's what the journey is so but I don't think anyone should regret for me I'm 10 years in next year mm. into this journey which is a lifetime in digital media like an absolute lifetime and if we go back to that kind of thing of pivoting or the our business plan in 2010 versus where we're now oh my god I mean it's it's it would it's, it's a joke you know and I think what we're actually doing now is creating a business plan for the 2020s and I hope there is going to be more consistency coming into it but as I said the change that we're going to continue to go through all businesses are going to continue to go through are profound but no I don't think as an entrepreneur you can ever have regret I think you've got to live with every decision mm -hmm. you've got to justify every decision you're going to get things wrong but again if we go back to that good instinct piece like that intuition is what separates the, the wheat from the chaff in terms of successful business people. It's listening to everything. I, I my st genuinely, my gut tells me things that haven't happened yet all of the time. Bad things as well. Mm. Like that's the actual interesting thing. This gut instinct isn't like all this opportunity base. It actually can mean that the entrepreneur goes around with a sense of foreboding where they, they sense something is going to go wrong and then it does. That's not necessarily an always Good, uh, always a good place to be. So the gut piece can be good and bad, but um, exit should never be seen as, uh, unless you've exited badly, but it should never be seen as a, as, as a regretful moment. There's loads of years left in lots of people who exit businesses relatively early in life and go on and do other things. And it's only a journey, it's only a stage and a process. And at some stage, I might not be involved in this business. Um, I know, you love I, it too much. I know, at nowhere. the moment, yeah. <laughs> Everyone keeps asking, but no, I love it at the moment. But you've got to accept it's a journey and you've got sure. to accept it is a business you got children they're far more important yeah, absolutely. in your family well I'm going to get you both if you don't mind to um, explore a little bit of um, you've both touched on this mystic Meg element of uh, good instinct enough times now for me to think there's really something um, here to, to explore with you guys I know there would be people watching this going gut instinct like what are they talking about and you're talking about something that to a lot of people is like a sixth sense or an ability they just don't have um, for those people who might be watching this going what is, how does a good instinct, what does that even feel like? Is there any roadmap you could give them? Are there any metrics you could look at? Like, if you do get that twinge of, oh, something's afoot, what would you then sit down and look at so that it's not a rash decision? How, how do you get from good instinct to actual, no, I'm doing this? I think that there's a fine balance between being sensible and practical. So anyone that's sitting there going, well, I'm going to leave my full-time job to go and explore this idea that I've got, I would always support that 100%, but as you've said, if you've got bills to pay, food to put on the table, you have to do your research, so don't be silly about it. I think you have to investigate the thing that you really think. So if you're going to go around making a chocolate kettle, obviously that's not going to work. Um, but I think that you have to have a really good understanding of it. You have to be passionate about it. And I also think that if you, one, one of the things that no one tells you when, when you start out is how long it'll take to get paid. So it'll take double the amount of time you think and three or four times the amount of work. And that's why you really need to love what you do because something needs to keep you going. So there's a lot of people that I see are starting businesses here and there and never finishing anything and never taking anything to fruition. So if you can do something, even if it's on the side for a little while to prove even to yourself that that's something that can A, work for you, B, works full stop mm. and C, may pay you, um, you have to prove it to yourself first, I think, because making a rash decision is probably not something I would unless you're forced into it, I would ever advise. Sure, um, unless you're invited to leave. And I was invited <laughs> to leave, so. <laughs> and what about you, Niall, just so we don't get uh, letters in going, he told me to follow my good instinct and I did, and look at me. Uh, yeah, well, look. What's the caveat? I would say there's two elements to it. One is people who are going to go and try and set up a business and the people who are in business successfully and try and break into two, in business successfully, and then how does their good instinct work? For me, uh, and again, touched on it before, you know, the, the, the good instinct at the startup phase isn't actually, I don't want to say as important. I, I want to move beyond the good instinct to decide whether to set up the business. It's like, that's that's more than just good instinct. That is uh, that is being brave. That is really making a, a big decision, as we said before on, on previous episodes, that could impact on your life and you've got to be right to do it. But when you do it, you've just got to just jump and do it and go at it, right? I'm right down there on that part of it. I think we've been there before. People who are running successful businesses, how their gut instinct works generally 
is is they become very, very, very in tune with the industry they're in. Again, good people, right? They become very, very in tune with the, with the industry that they're in. So therefore, they can see and sense trends probably better than any of the employees because they're, they obsess about it. One of the things as well with people who are running businesses, uh, and we talk about this, uh, you know, you know what? What is a what is an what is an actual working week for someone who runs a business? There is no there is no in terms of employment. There is no contract that uh, an entrepreneur signs up to. You can't stop yourself thinking about the business uh, six o'clock on on a Saturday evening or five o'clock uh, in the morning if you're up early on a Sunday. Like you can't stop that. You, you can, but you can't decide if you can or not. When that business just slips in, if you go for a run. Does it kick into your head? It may or may not. And again, as people go on, they'll have other things, other challenges they'll have to face in life. But ultimately, because you're so emotionally attached to business at all times, that then makes you emotionally attached to the industry and that makes you, that makes your gut continue to tell you stuff. So what I'd say to people who've not been in business is if they're going into a specific industry, they can't have a good instinct for that industry until they get into it. Now, they may have a good instinct as regards, this is why I want to go into this space. But when they get in and understand what their competitors are doing, understand where their market is going, understand what their staff are thinking, then your gut instinct starts to really, really, really come to the fore and take on a life of its own. Um, and genuinely, I do believe it is the number one uh it's the number one thing a person can have because as Rani mentioned earlier, you can listen to accountants mm -hmm. and I've often, you know, brought trouble on myself by not always listening to accountants, but I, I guarantee you I've built more successful aspects of the business by just plowing my own way and deciding what I want to do because uh, the entrepreneur or the partners that start at the top of a business have to have a shared common goal and then what dictates how they get there will often be gut instinct on the way. So and it's not the accountant's baby either, you know? Like no, well, um, yeah, in some cases it is, but a lot of cases you're right, it isn't. And yeah. uh, you've, got to, you've got to bring a team of people, you've got to go and try and create a business and it's down to the entrepreneur to build the thing. That is their job in the business. Their job is to drive this thing on. So you can get to X next year and think you've done well or you can go to Y. Mm. And sometimes the people people who get to why will be the people who've just decided to listen to their guns and not be reined in by um, a more practical response to something. So I think that for people running successful businesses, the gut, gut instinct is something that will continue to grow and grow and grow. And don't worry if you don't have it at the beginning, because it comes from understanding your market better. Okay, I think that's a really important point there. Don't worry if you don't have it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might be very happy and comforted to hear that. And, and Rani, it must be something you have to impart on a lot of young companies and, and people you deal with in the World Trade Centre. Yeah. You know, do you see that a lot or what's the sign of somebody who's going to be able to pivot, somebody who can go the distance? Yeah, so we do see that a lot because typically in the World Trade Center, what we're dealing with specifically is entrepreneurs who've gone past the three 500k mark, so they're specifically looking to expand internationally. And to do that takes a completely different skill set. Um, the one thing that I actually hear quite a lot, which is surprising, is that people never, the entrepreneurs will come to us, they have that goal in mind, they want to get to the, they're the ones that want to get to the why, they're following their gut instinct. They've decided this is something that they're going to do. Um, but when they never really think about the money, they understand it's going to come. So they don't let themselves be held back by the things that other people probably would think that would hold them back. And I think that when people have that fuel and that fire, what I really see in them, um, in this particular type of entrepreneur, is it's, it takes bravery to start and sustain a business. It takes even more bravery to go into a completely foreign market where you haven't got a clue what's going on and then be brave enough to go and pursue that. So we're working with a lot of people now who want to get into Walmart, which is up-leveling any business that they could he have here in their domestic market and taking it to, in, to a stratospheric space. So it takes real guts and courage to do that. And I think that you need the, the passion and the fuel and the fire and everything else tends to come along with it. So the trend that I'm seeing and the conversations that I have is people just have this one goal in mind and they'll pretty much do anything to get it. Yeah, I think it's a good point in that, you know, for businesses that are in Ireland that want to go stratospheric, because again, you know, that was mentioned and a lot of people have that and they want to do it for the wrong reasons. I think if you can create a scenario where you can go international, so let's say you've created a successful business in a digital market like Ireland, right? And that's paying the bills and it's giving you a great quality of life and you're happy, but you feel like you have, an op you have more fuel in the tank and you can take the next level. I always think it's better, certainly the way I would do it, is to try and create a scenario where you can protect mm -hmm. the, the home and then have a free shot at the international part of the business. So you gotta, what you don't want to do is just, I don't believe, is... is when you're, again, this is based on business now. A lot of people that will listen to this show or watching this show will be successful in Ireland to a point and then they want to take the next step. But if they are, how do you protect that? That has to be the first 
kind of thing you need to box off so how can I create a scenario Pivotal where I can go yeah, yeah well how I can go and that can be involved with setting up a separate company structure in a different market and so on and so forth so it's not just everything on black and then if the international piece goes wrong because you're never going to be there right that's the other thing for, or, or, for a lot of people they, they are, they're still going to be tied to Ireland unless you're making a decision to live 200 plus days outside of Ireland mm. you live in Ireland you'll pay your tax in Ireland you will have to get paid in Ireland so if you're not there as much then you've got to be prepared to, you have to protect the Irish business first and then go on and take the crack at it. So if you, if you can do that, that sets you up nicely. If it's a partnership scenario uh, or there's three or four partners, definitely I would advocate that. Same thing, protect the Irish business, but that one or two of the partners, depending on how many is, have to go to that market and live and breathe it. Uh, I, see, I know one company in Ireland that is very successful in Ireland. They're going to another market. They're going to the UK. And uh, one of the partners is making the decision that they're going to live there. And yeah. I'm like, bang, and that Cogs is the and right Marvel thing did to that do. as well, remember when we Yes, went, yeah, of yeah. course. Jane is based Ro here. Yeah, and Roisin went off to the US. And Roisin, yeah. and give up a, ho a huge amount. Like, I mean, Roisin has a young family and give up a huge amount to do it. Because when I met uh, Roisin on the, on the UI Entrepreneur of the Year in 2017, that was one of the things I was struck by, mm. was that the raw sacrifice. And again, like if those two individuals sell that business for tens of millions, people will forget the sacrifice that they have made to do that. Because mm. that cannot have been easy. And uh, they're, they're, the, they're the things that entrepreneurs do and sacrifices they make all of the time. And it's often forgotten in the heat of the moment when people just see the, I think it's that whole thing of like, you know, people see the iceberg, you know, the meme yeah, that yeah. goes around, they see the top and they don't see what's underneath. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but in that, in that example, Col Cogs or Mar Marvel, they're going to extraordinary lengths mm -hmm. to make their business success and I wish them the very best with that. Great. Well, look, we're going to leave it there for this particular conversation, but stay with me because I'm going to come back to both of you in just a few minutes for your one to watch. My next guest spent many years in finance, managing banks and his own consultancy firm before being offered an opportunity he couldn't resist in a totally different industry. He gave up finance completely to become the managing director of a company manufacturing and selling health supplements. Those health supplements are now on the shelves of the biggest retailers in Ireland and the UK. It's Dahi O'Connor of Revive Active. Dahi O'Connor, welcome and thanks for being here. Due to the nature of today's show, it's about pivoting. You have done one of the most amazing pivots I've ever heard of. You went from uh, a lifetime in finance into health supplements. That might not seem to many people like a natural progression or a natural step to take. Talk to me about that. What happened there? Well, I suppose business is, is um, in finance, it's, um, the product is money. In health food supplements, the, the product is a health food supplement. But... Um, for me, um, 2008, eight nine uh, in finance, the whole country was falling apart, and uh, it was it was a difficult time. The banks were literally closed, mm. and so um, we were, I was looking for different opportunities, and um, I was introduced to a group of doctors, and these doctors were into complementary medicine, and they were saying that. They wanted the health and well-being of their patients or health and well-being of people and they would have to get maybe 15 different tablets. Or <coughs> So what I saw within this, um, and I researched this for nearly 18 months, was that there was no real top quality product that incorporated everything that they wanted to do to give all these multiple benefits. So I pulled together a number of people and I, I pitched it. I said, look, what we need to do is set up our own company. We need to have our own brand. We need to formulate our own product. So we went with one particular product and it's totally backed by science. So we had a PhD in molecular medicine. We had a PhD in sports nutrition. We had nutritional uh, therapists involved. And so what we got was we got their wish list and we tried to make a product that incorporated everything. So we ended up with Revive Active, which is the brand and was our first product and still is our lead product. 26 active ingredients covering multiple benefits from natural energy, boosting your immune system, cardiovascular, um, and many more um, benefits that are reported back, all in a powdered sachet that can be taken with water in the morning. And so this was the product that we went with but we were a little bit naive. Um, we were looking for contract manufacturers. We had to put equity in, our own equity in. Um, and so it brought in 
a range of different things that I had to look at. Mm. So there were only two of us at the beginning. Um, so you were wearing multiple hats. You were looking at finance, which was fine. So I was watching the money, of which we had none. Um, <laughs> and then you were production. Then you had to design your boxes, your sachets, your marketing, um, your online, your website. Um, and it just went on. Mm. But uh, it was a very exciting mm. time as well. And it must have been a bit daunting, Dahi, as well, because, you know, it was the height of a recession and you were literally going door to door to pharmacies in Galway saying, please stock my product. P.S. Pay me up front because, you know, I can't really manage credit right now. That yeah. must have been, it seemed like a near impossible task at the time. And now you're in a thousand pharmacies. I suppose. How did you get from A to B? <laughs> I, I thought long and hard um, a before going forward because it was my own reputation was on the line and I was writing a check. But I had huge belief in what we were doing. We were helping people. I felt we had the best product, not alone in the Irish market, but in the European market or maybe the American market. We could see nothing else to match this. So I, I had a vision that this would be successful. It was only a matter of trying to be able to get it out there. So, yeah, it was daunting that you were going into um, pharmacies. And at the time, it was 2011, July 2011, we started. So you were bombarded with bad news on TV, radio, papers, gloom and doom, no way out. So the pharmacies and health food stores saw this as green shoots. They saw it as something fresh, something new. This was... Okay. Um, when they looked at the product then and looked at the back of the box and looked at the, the level of ingredients that were involved and the amount of ingredients there, they said, yes, we have nothing like this here. Mm. We'll take it from you. And those that supported us, I remember I went to Adrian Mullins in Salt Hill, Mullins' pharmacy, and he said, I'll take it. And I said, well, we're going to have to ask you to pay up front. Yeah. And he said, that's OK, we'll do that. And then they started selling and then the people were coming back. And all these different pharmacies start to grow in confidence. And, uh, and that's how we grew. But it was, it was small shoots at the beginning in, in, in Galway. And it was Galway City mm. and then spread to the county. Um, and to what extent do you think your own personal brand had something to do with that? Would, you mentioned an Adrian Mullins there. Would he have been known to you? Is that how you kind of got your foot in the door at the start? People yeah. trusted you because they knew you? Yeah, there would have been a certain amount of that. They, they would have known you. But then, you know, this was a new product. So they had to be convinced and the product convinced them as well. So yeah. um, it, it no was... No going to buy a lot of stock just because you're you, I suppose. No, yeah. they're, they're, they're not. Mm. Um, but confidence started to grow as, as we grew with them. And then with, even without any money, we were, we were on Facebook, we were on Twitter, we were on Instagram. Mm. Uh, I was getting interviews with the local radio station, the local papers, because it was, it was exciting, it was different. Mm. It was a different story, it was a startup. And uh, they kind of embraced that story. And they you know, said, good for you. And, mm. and, uh, um, and people, People bought online, people bought in the pharmacies, on health food stores. Uh, nutritional therapists uh, took to it straight away because they're very knowledgeable with regard to health food supplements. Mm. And they would say, we've got nothing. There's nothing like this in, in, in our stores in Ireland. Yeah. Uh, when I'm not here with Joe, I'm actually working for Web Summit, where uh, one of the areas that I cover is health and the health stage there and health tech generally. And... I can tell you that wellness and supplements and the idea of food as medicine is the most popular thing year on year. People are obsessed with it. But there's still a bit of a backlash. There's still a huge number of pe people out there who think, you know, that supplements are a bit of a pseudoscience or quackery. Did you have to deal with any of that or was it yeah. was that not the, the temperature <clears throat> in Ireland at the time? Well, I, I, I suppose there's, there's a range of products on the market. So we're at the upper end and ours is backed by science. Um, if you look at our, our lead product, Revive Active, and I'm not going to go into all the ingredients, but sure. let's say coenzyme Q10, and some people put in five uh, milligrams. We have 150 because uh, the American Cardiology Society reckon that anybody over 40 should be taking between 100 and 200. Now, this is involved in a... Uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry uh, 
back in 1978. Japanese have been using it since the 70s. It became commercial in the 80s. Top quality product or ingredient. Elarginine is for heart health, for, for blood circulation, won a Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1998, the discovery of. Mm. They're just two. We have no preservatives. We have no artificial sweeteners. We have no um, artificial colouring. Everything we do is at the top level. So um, doctors are recommending our product. Mm. Um, consultants are recommending our product. Consultants in, in, you know, all over the country. Nurses are fully behind us and they love what we're doing because it's at that level that is making a big difference to the individual. Mm. Um, it's at a cellular level. And um, so, you know, we can't speak about other products. We can only speak about our own. And, you know, we're very transparent about what we do in every product. You know, some people would have um, pure collagen. You don't know whether that's marine collagen or beef collagen. Mm. So we actually say where are the source of our ingredients, the level of ingredients, what we do. We, we encourage people to ask questions. And of course, um, like Revive Active is vegan, vegetarian, um, diabetic friendly, celiac friendly. So it covers right, a multitude. Yeah, you've kind of closed <laughs> down any avenue of <laughs> protest or opposition there might possibly be there. Yeah, well, uh, finally, I'd just say mm. on that note, the um, <clears throat> retail pharmacies of Ireland voted our product Revive Active number one vitamin, mineral and dietary supplement in January 2019. That's a great milestone to hit. Huge endorsement. We were delighted. Well, I guess another milestone for you would have been when you decided to buy out the shareholders. Um, yeah. Tell us how that went. Was <clears> that something you always wanted to do or were you just confident based on how things were going? Two main shareholders. I was majority shareholder and um, I had another executive uh, who was a shareholder. And um, it's one of the things that happens in lots of companies that, that shareholding, and it can get... It can get kill a company, yeah. It can, it can kill a company. Mm. Um, but we got to a stage that um, he wanted to go his own way. I had a vision of where I wanted to bring the company. He didn't fully uh, share that vision, but it, but it was amicable then. So if somebody is not really interested in the vision mm. or where it's going, it's best and that they move on and they have other interests then that they can get involved in. So we came to a... a um, came to a figure and um, that everybody was happy with and that that's the way it worked. But so it was very good from, and from my point of view, then I could just look forward. Yeah. And do you think that um, that change in, in ownership, I suppose, changed things for you? Did it maybe take you in a different direction or solidify things psychologically for you that this, this was your baby now? Yeah. Yours alone. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I, I was I was delighted. Um, it was it, it didn't change direction or vision. It was still the same, but it was very much my own. And um, you know, if you're putting twenty four seven into something, and uh, you know you, you if and if you get you know you should have the shareholding. Otherwise, it'll cause all sorts of friction. Mm. So um, I was putting my heart and soul into the company. And, um, you know, you can talk to my family, the Saturdays and Sundays, I disappear and they'll ring the office and find me. Mm -hmm. So and, and, and that's what it takes to bring a company forward. And uh, so to do it and know that you're in total control of your destiny within the company, that was very satisfying. And it must have been very satisfying, too, to move jobs from Wales back to Mullingar, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so you're it, manufacturing now at home? Yeah, well, the, the um, Brexit in 2016. Um, so we had Slash to... Slash, whenever. <laughs> <laughs> whenever is right. We, we were looking at that and um, we always wanted to bring our manufacturing back to Ireland. But, um, you know, <clears throat> with the expansion of the company, you're always looking at the figures, you're looking at your cash flow and the investment it would take. And we were looking and say, well, could we afford to do it, to bring it back to Ireland? And then with Brexit and you come to 2017, the question was, 
could you not afford to do it? It, right. it, it, it? And we had to make that decision. So our head of production uh, is uh, Colm Horton. And Colm has been with the company for the last three years. He was the one really that was the main instigator. Uh, we found the premises. We both looked at it. But he has huge experience in this area. We mapped out. We made a state-of-the-art uh, uh, premises. We were backed by our bank, AIB. And we... we um, we opened for business in March. Uh, most of the people who are employed there are local. Um, Enterprise Ireland backed us as mm. well. Ten new jobs. We're in full production in Mullingar. We still have Wales. Mm. If there's a hard Brexit, we will have Wales as a standalone. But even for contingency and for our relationship, we've we good relationship with them, we still have Wales there. And I'd say if there's, if there's no hard Brexit, hopefully there isn't, mm. um, we will look at Wales because we, we would see maybe in the next year or two, capacity will cause an issue um, and w we could end up doing, um, you know, double shifts in Mullingar. And it's great to have Wales there. So I'm very proud to have the guaranteed Irish symbol of course. Um, and to be, for, even for our retailers, to say, that's an Irish product, mm. you know, and uh, uh, so, yeah, it was it was great and, and uh, it's grown the company. Um, and it's obviously worked out well um, and yet, you know, you've kind of alluded to there that your hand was a little bit forced um, or the timing certainly due to Brexit. Is that something that you see happening or, or hear of happening in your own circles with other Irish based businesses at the moment? Is, is Brexit having that sort of effect generally? Yeah, I, I, I think um, there are some that are just wait and see. There are some, particularly the larger firms have all taken action. They're all prepared. And then there's others that have been trading for a long number of years and just said, well, look, if it happens and we can't export to England, we'll just close up shop, which is, you know, it's very disappointing mm -hmm. if, if that's uh, going to be the case. So, yeah, but Enterprise Ireland have been saying, you know, prepare for the worst um, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been roadshows and information for everybody. Um, so, you know, it's not as if people weren't warned in advance. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, Dahi, uh, the, the, the topic of this show being the pivot and you've done a pretty epic pivot in your career, as we've, we've outlined. What would you say the next pivot is likely to be for you or for the company? I know you've entered some brand new markets in the last while. Yeah, I, I think um, there's a lot of growth within Ireland. Mm. Um, and I think we have new product development. We have our own um, R&D department and we've collaborated like with the Kerry Group and with the University of Northumbria. I would see us doing, you know, new product development, uh, definitely in collaboration with one of the universities in Ireland. Um, from a business growth point of view, we will expand in Ireland. We have huge opportunity in the UK still and in London. 10 million people, cosmopolitan city, won't really be affected by Brexit. They still have, like, a lot of the people coming into Selfridges and we're stocked in John Bell and Croydon off Harley Street. They're, they have a different mix of people coming in there. But the big push for us will be into the US. Um, the vitamin, mineral and dietary supplement sector in the US is 40 billion. Uh, if you compare the US to the UK, the US consumer is five times more likely to buy our product than the UK consumer. Um, we've been, myself and Colm Horton, our production manager, were in LA last November looking at... Uh, uh, manufacturing facilities and logistics. Um, we've done huge amount of research because we have to change all our, our um, boxes and branding to introduce um, product into the market. Um, we expect in early 2020 to introduce our first product on a digital basis into the East Coast. Um, but I see this as a massive growth area for us. I don't believe that there are products like ours on the American market. Um, they've embraced the supplement culture. Um, we think we can even take a small amount of, of the market there would be, would be colossal. And, um, and even on, from an Irish point of view, um, there are doors that are open to us there. And um, also, you know, all the social media are, are the same 
And we have customers in the States as it is. They buy from us online. So um, they're unsolicited and they're buying from us. So um, I would see that as a, as a major growth area. And do you think will FDA regulations and approval be an issue when you want to go from online to on shelves? Uh, no, um, it, it would be the same, uh, but we're, our product will be produced in a registered FDA approved facility. Um, so um, that's, that cuts all of that out. And you mentioned that you uh, the unsolicited um, sales online, Ghana and Afghanistan and New Zealand as well. That must be quite a confidence boost to see people organically find their way to you from such yeah. exotic locations. We, we've, we've sold into 43 different countries online um, from Ecuador to Afghanistan. And, and believe it or not, we, we actually did a shipment last week, a retail shipment to Nigeria we have a, a pharmacy chain of 30 pharmacies um, that, that have bought um, through an Irish connection. Mm. But uh, there's 150 million people in Nigeria. All the missionaries that have been there it's mean a nice that... nice big market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the patron saint is St. Patrick. There's <laughs> it's, uh, but it's just, yeah, uh, New Zealand, Afghanistan, UAE. We've shipped all over the world. Well, exciting times uh, in the past and in the future for you, Dahi, it seems. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, thanks very much, Yvonne. And, and I'd just like to say that it's, I'm just here on behalf of the Revive Active team and we're really lucky with the team that we have um, from the production to the sales to the marketing. It's, it's a really combined effort. Dahi O'Connor there with a pretty epic pivot story. Now still with me are Niall McGarry and Rani Debray who are about to tell me what their one to watch this week is in business. What about you Niall? Let's start with you. Uh, I suppose I'm following the story that Brian kind of brought to our attention uh, a couple of weeks back. Brian Caulfield where we're talking about WeWork and you know far away from me to wish ill on any other business but this this is a big landmark moment for the venture capital world and for the world of business that we're in at the, uh, as, as we know at the moment that some of these huge gargantuan San Francisco based um, unicorns that have come out of nowhere in the last 5-10 years and what are they built on so we work are in a scenario where at the moment where it looks like they're burning about 750 million a quarter mm -hmm. and have maybe cash reserves of about 2.5 million so you can see that the challenge that creates they went for IPO pulled out of it I think the media or their PR people are dressing it up as a kind of a scenario where it's like, you know, we, it was too early. But I think there's a big, big question mark. Brian knows about this space far more than me. But what was in, what's interesting for me is, is how many people they have employed globally, how much is at stake here and how, and again, SoftBank too, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And that could have wider. But but ultimately, it's this thing again of like certain businesses that are built up to be huge things that are built on sand and they could come down. And I just like this could trigger some big economic challenges for the world economy, because um, obviously those challenges can come from what seems like re relatively innocuous collapses. So just keeping an eye on that story still. And I kind of advise anyone in business just to watch what that's going. We all wish them well. We all hope it. It all works out there, but um, it kind of brings back from an Irish entrepreneur perspective of, but don't build your, your business on sand, build it on sustained profitability. And that has to be the mind's eye of your mission from the very beginning. From an, in, an industry perspective, one to watch, um, I really think, um, and it's interesting with the Revive Active story, the Revive brand story, um, the health and wellness, um, beauty, I think that's an industry that's really, really catapulting now um, into the stratosphere because um, over in, in the States, it's been a fairly stagnant industry for quite some time. So there's been a few big players that have dominated it. And now they, these big players are actually going along and buying up all of these unique, innovative brands that are coming up. So something like Pestle and Mortar, for example, which is an Irish brand. Mm. Um, the Revive, they're, they're all really unique and interesting because people want something that's uh, natural, organic, different. Um, and this is, a, this is a space that's really, really growing. And that's what we're seeing. Definitely, and that keeps coming up for us, doesn't mm. it? We've had Samuel Dennigan, we've had The Skin Nerd, uh, Kali Kali has come up a few times. I think both, both of you would probably agree then that you know wellness and, and healthy living is the one to watch generally at the moment, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, because it was probably, it's an area that's been like grossly underserved because if we go back to the 1980s, probably people didn't take themselves uh, as care, as good a care as themselves as they need to. So obviously this is just going to be a space to continue to grow in because there's just, this, you know, no, there is a lot of brands going into that space right now, okay? And the people who can tell their brand story the best are the ones that are probably create the most market share. But uh, with Sam, who I know is going to be a big part of the show here and we're going to be 
documenting and following his journey in America. That's really, really interesting because it goes back to the Cogs and Marvel thing. Sam is uprooting his, again, uh, wife and, and, and young child to go to America to put down roots, which will be the series we'll be doing, to actually go and chase the dream in America, despite having a very successful business in Ireland and the UK. And uh, like, th I, I really wish him well. Raised 18 million very recently. Again, he has to put it to good use. I've always said you've got to raise the cash yeah. and then use it and then build something bigger. But I've no doubt with someone like Sam, uh, his etiquette and business manner is just top class. And we've We've done a lot of dealings with him, and I wish him the best. But we're looking forward to documenting that journey and see where this, where this revolution in food goes. And it's great to see Irish brands at the forefront of it, though. I do think that's something that we have a unique take on. There is like it's only when you go abroad and you go to a supermarket in Spain, for instance, and you get frustrated by the absolute lack of anything that's not just massively uh, mass produced. Yeah. When you go to you know supermarkets in Ireland, there's just such an array of different options so I'm lactose intolerant so I, I, everyone thinks I'm vegan but I'm actually dairy from milk but I get a noble tub of ice cream every weekend as my kind of treat and it's just like made it's made I think it's middle nowhere I'd love to know the county I should know the county but it's just made in the middle of Ireland and again it's just a great brand doing great stuff but it's great to be able to get it mm. I think the frustration would have been four or five years ago you wouldn't be able to get these things the for supermarkets I guess. Well, yeah, supermarkets yeah, yeah. are starting to see it yeah and they're all getting on the, so it's great to see Irish brands at the forefront of this health and great. fitness revolution ok guys thank you so much that's where we're going to leave it Niall McGarry of Maximum Media and of course Ronnie Dubrai of the World Trade Centre Dublin thanks for being with us that's it for this week's show and thanks to our partners in AIB for backing All In. Now, on next week's show, we'll be talking about the money, how to raise capital for your company. Of all the options out there, which one is the best one for you? And if you can bootstrap, should you? And in the All In Trailblazer hot seat, we'll have a man who left his high-flying role at the top of Board Namona to create and sell a number of different companies. And his latest venture sees him at the head of Supernode, a company right on the cutting edge of renewable energy. You won't want to miss the interview with Eddie O'Connor on next week's All In. In the meantime, you can, of course, contact us by using the hashtag All In Business. Please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>